Let me tell you, we're in a very, very interesting time frame. And I know that many of you are overcoming just obstacles, obstructions, hindrances. All of these things must yet come to pass. But look up, because your redemption is drawing nigh now. Everything that I read, everything that I hear, everything that I sense in my spirit says one thing, hold fast, hold fast. Don't be moved by what you think or what you see or what the devil tells you or what other people tell you or what grandma or grandpa tell you, unless it's in agreement with the word of the living God. Yeah? Every one of us here have opportunities of doing many things and in being involved in many things. But it's the things that concern the kingdom of God that concern God the most. It's how we conduct our lives in such a way that it brings honor to him and blessing to those around us who A, either know the name of the Lord and are born again, or those who don't know him and need to know him. The only thing that we ever accomplish on this earth that's worth anything, and you can believe me, as you get older, you, you start to redefine the things that are important to you. And as a believer in Christ, the only things that really make a difference are the things that have made a difference. So as you develop a walk with God, he'll give you more and more opportunities to demonstrate how you feel about him and whether or not you're willing to put your hand to the plow. And if you are, how long are you willing to plow? How deep are you willing to plow? How long in the day are you willing to plow? How much are you willing to put in to the things of the kingdom? Once you join the kingdom, the training process begins but also the dying process. Amen. As you, as you get older, it's not just physical dying that you need to concern yourself with. It's your spiritual recognition of those things that are needful. And the way God has created man, created you and created me, is that nothing can take the place of what was until we're willing to let it go. Now, if you listen very carefully to what I just said, it's the key to unlock your future. I mentioned to somebody the other day that we're all schizophrenic, not in the clinical term, perhaps, but we're schizophrenic from the point of view that we are two personalities, two people. We are two individuals, and we don't really define our personality and who we are until we give our hearts to Christ or we deny God that right. Now, I said that to say this because it, it kind of gets a little bit involved. Every nation in the world, as believers, as Christians, every nation in the world, we believe, came from the same original root. If you believe in the Garden of Eden and the book of Genesis, just about everything you'll ever want to learn about what's in the Bible is in the book of Genesis in a summarized form. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and then went on to create mankind and then woman and then starts the progression of history till we get to Noah. Ham, Seth, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, it says in the Bible, generated and populated the entire earth. Crazy as that sounds, it means that every human being on the face of this planet had their origin with God. Now, how is that such an impactive thing in the times when I'm fully persuaded that the Lord is returning soon. The trouble is, children of God, if I, if I know one thing, it's this. I cannot help anyone except the ones that God sends me. Now, the Bible's interesting because it says, if the people who came, and I'll, I'll, I'll reel these scriptures off to you as I get round to it. But if we read the scriptures accurately, it says that the ones that were sent to us in the Gospel of John, the ones that were sent to us, if they never really belonged to us, it explains why they left us. Now, that, that tells me that God is sovereign. Now, I'm not just talking, when he says us, he's not talking about a particular church or denomination. Well, he is really. But he's saying that for those that God has sent me, they can't be removed from me because God sent them to me. Now, that rule of sowing and reaping, it, it works its way through the entire scriptures. So it means that those whom God has apportioned, apportioned here to this house, they may choose to leave. But if God hasn't, release them, then no matter where they go, they still belong here. Because God himself is not schizophrenic. We are two people. We are the old man and the new man. We are the God-fearing person, the spirit being that belongs to God, who was sealed by the spirit of the living God, by the blood of the Lamb Jesus, we have been united into his body. Or we are carnal, driven by the flesh, led by our own instincts and our own opinions and our own feelings, and tend to flow wherever we want to go. We are an independent being, and God created us that way until we hand over our sovereignty to God. Now, we can make that as complicated or as easy as we want it to be. What's happening now worries me a little bit because, because we are approaching the, the final closure. There are a lot of people very confused about how they're going to tell when the Lord is coming back. 
Now, I can give you some parameters here, some insights. Knowing that we all belong to God, how does that affect me in this time and season? It affects me because I don't want to be too complicated with you, nor do I want you getting so twisted up in all the theories or the signs or the wonders. Because Jesus promised you, in the time that that comes, the whole world will know it at the same time. Now, how is that possible if the, if the see, now people find, look for things to find? How can that be? As the lightning flash from the east or the west, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Well, quite simply, it's going to be covered around the world with global satellites. Because the world's round, it isn't flat. And if the whole world is going to see him, then the whole world has to be broadcast he's coming because he's coming at a particular place. Therefore, if he's coming at a particular place in the clouds, that's, how, that's going to have to be covered. Now, Jesus also said something interesting, that during the approach or the time coming toward his return, all kind of theories are going to come up. And if I had the time, and I, for, for whatever reason, in America, we're not told that we can have as much time as we want. I don't know why that is. I mean, Jesus kept preaching until, you know, people started complaining and their stomachs started growling. And he said, well, tell them not to go anywhere. I'll feed them here. They saw the Son of God perform miracles so they could eat. And then he kept talking. Paul kept speaking until a guy fell asleep and fell out of the window. Instead of freaking out, calling an ambulance, he went downstairs, laid hands on him and raised him from the dead. And then what happened then? Took him back upstairs and continued to teach. So see, now, where is our priorities? See, I've always figured this. The day that I don't go to work is the day the boss will show up and, and see I'm not there. The day I don't assemble in the household of the Lord is the day that maybe the Lord will come. I want you to get a grab, a hold of the things that are coming on the earth. And see, God is bringing back the prodigals. Want is just one of many. There's a lot more coming. And they're not coming for me. They're coming with God saying this, it's time to go home. I want to make one statement to you because this will change your life if you get like I did the other day when I read this. And I scribbled it down because it's important. Two words that are very, very important for you to get a hold of for this season that you're living in now. With all the trials, the difficulties and the hassles and the people that are driving you crazy and for all the things that are trying to rob you of your peace and the devil screaming in your ears with some stupid argument that really upsets you and takes away your peace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Jesus in the wilderness. Religious people are losing it because they think in memorizing the scripture, they'll find peace and they don't. It's in knowing Christ and it's knowing the power of the Holy Ghost and it's giving up on yourself and, and, and attaching yourself to the power of God that gives you that peace. Greater than you is he that dwells within you. You see what I'm saying? The word there greater doesn't just mean bigger. It means more powerful. So we have to pull on the power that is not ours. It is ours by inheritance but not ours internally, inherently. These two words, I want you to remember them. The words return and restore. These are going to be guidelines for you for the next few years. Return and restore. I want, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you because this deals with a particular event. And you may be familiar with it. It's the word jubilee. How many are familiar with the word jubilee? Now, jubilee, of course, <clears throat> is the 50th year after the 49th year. And the 50th year... Jubilee was proclaimed throughout all of Israel. Now, I can just give you a couple of quick ones here. Leviticus 25, verse 10. Leviticus 25, verse 10. Leviticus 25, and I want to go back to verse 8. And I'll make it quick. All you've got to remember is the word jubilee and the words re return and restore. Because jubilee means to return and to restore. It means going back to the point where you got disconnected and then God sovereignly giving back to you everything that you lost. That, that has to happen at a certain time and season. Now everybody's saying that, oh, it's going to happen in the next jubilee. The problem is the final jubilee happens at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The previous jubilee has already happened. Now there's a time frame. So from the time that Jesus Christ was cut off, Daniel chapter 7, and if you want me to continue and, 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 and pull that out a little bit more, just wave at me and I'll go back and read that scripture for you. Okay, all right. Let's do this one first. Let's, let's read, read, read this one. And I'm glad you have an interest in knowing that because it's the details that will screw you up or bless you up. You, see, Satan knows the details, right? But he only knows the details historically. Revelation, he doesn't have. Because he's been cut off from the flow of the Spirit of the living God when it comes to knowing what's coming next. Amen. All he knows is his time is getting short and he knows that by historical facts that have happened and are on the way to being happening. He knows that his time is short, therefore he's stepping up whatever he can do to steal from you that which is your inheritance. But on the Jubilee, he had to give it back. Now, let, let me read this to you. Every 50th year, I'm reading from verse 8, chapter 25 of the book of Leviticus. Every 50th year on the day of atonement, listen to it carefully, let the trumpets blow loud 
and long throughout the Holy Land. Now, there are a lot of folks now out there are teaching that, you know, President Trump has a lot to do with the sounding of the Trump, and I don't believe that, but I do believe that he has a place in history. And I believe his place in history parallels that with Cyrus, which was raised up by God. Cyrus was, was not... Uh, connected to God's people in any way except God raised him up and gave the people of God favor with him and when he took over the leadership Cyrus raised a whole bunch of money and gave it to the Jews and said when you leave out of the 70 years of bondage that you've had with us Syrians you'll have enough money now to rebuild your temple so outside sources funded the return of the people of God. All right? Now, just get this one right. Because all of the things that you've seen come to pass because of your faith individually to God will eventually be overridden by a gigantic tidal wave of what God is doing. That's like Jubilee. That God, gets his, God says, all right, you've done all right by yourself. Now move out of the way and let me take over. Because I'm going to tidal wave the whole thing. It's not just one or two Egyptians that are going to show you favor or Cyrus. He says, when I give you favor with the Egyptians, it's going to be with a whole lot of them, all of them. They will have no choice except to bless God's people. Now, this is what's our inheritance. This is what's going to pay for, fund for, and keep God's people provided for. You won't have to worry about manna coming from the heavens anymore. God will provide what's necessary for you to go and buy it, and the people of the world will give what you want to you. This is their... The Bible says this is their inheritance. This is their sole duty is to lay up, to work and labor hard, to lay up for those who are right before God. But that comes at a certain time. So here's, here, here we come. Look, For the 50th year shall be holy, a time to proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the enslaved debtors, those who owe. It's going to be a time for all the debtors to be set free from their debts and a time for the canceling of all public and private debts. It shall be a year when all the family estates sold to other people shall be returned to their original owners and their rightful heirs. You following me? Please try to get a hold of this because this is not something you can even imagine is possible. All you have to know is it's going to happen because in you believing it's going to happen, your faith is released and you'll be looking for it. And now when God begins to restore what's been stolen from you and your family and your parents, right? For whatever reason, God will intervene before the return of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is coming back on the last jubilee. Having said that to you, he follows on and says, what a happy year that's going to be. In this, you will not sow, you will not gather crops or grapes. You won't have to work. I mean, all you, you work all your life, right? You give your heart to Christ, you work all your life, you labor, you raise children, you have your problems, your ups, your downs, your happy days, bad days, blah, blah, blah. And then when you leave your body, everything is free. All the tears get wiped away and the reward of eternal life is given to you. See, there is a time for labor and there's a time to sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Christianity, listen, children of God, Christianity is a labor. It's not a lot of fun sometimes. And learning how to let go and let God is a hard lesson. And I know you're going through it. Trouble is, most of the people out there haven't figured out what's going on yet. And they're still looking for a way around the problem of giving their heart to God. So they're giving their heart to a God, but it's not the God. Because if you're going to give your heart to God, the price he wants you to pay for it is more than you can afford. It's, it's shielded with tears and heartache and having to be patient and having your heart broken and then feeling exalted high on the mountaintop and then to base low, low, low down into the valley and through it all waking up the next morning and say, here am I, Lord. I'm still standing. He says, what a happy day for it'll be a holy year of jubilee for you. That year, your food shall be the volunteer crops that grow wild in the field. So what does that mean? It means that you will survive very nicely on that which God grows supernaturally. What God grows what we used to call weeds during Jubilee, even the weeds are edible because he wanted the ground to be laid fallow. He didn't want you to have to work it. Every seven years, that, that Sabbath day was supposed to be a day of rest. What have we turned it into? You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day, which was a Saturday. Now it's the Lord's day as a Sunday. If we have an understanding that there are some things God says, I want you to have as a gift from me. You can't work for them. You try to work for them, it'll turn sour, like the manna. Yeah? He said, you can only collect that on the day that I give it to you. If you try to get greedy right, and hoard it up, it's going to go rotten. It'll get worms in it. Why? Because God said, what I give you, don't have to pay for. And you can't pay for it any more than, than, uh, than uh, Cain, who killed Abel, because Cain brought the fruit of his own hands. You see what I'm saying? The fruit of the fruit of the ground. He brought that, and God says, no, "That's not acceptable." You know, you grew that. When you when you bring me a sacrifice, blood's got to be attached to it, and the and the innocence of it has to be attached to it. And you knew that, but because there's a part of you that was evil, the Canaanites came from Cain, and 
And of the three sons of Noah, one of them was Ham, thank you. Ham was the descendant of all of the Canaanites and all of the evil tribes that give the people who got such a hard time when they came out. I see, I could go forever on this stuff. Yes, the year of Jubilee, everyone shall return home to his original family possession. If he has sold it, it shall become his again. Now, your original family possession is your salvation. So when God talks about you returning, for a long time I used to think, people would preach and still do, that the promised land is heaven. And I don't believe that's so anymore because there's giants in that land, right? Who's, who are destined to try to destroy us and, 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 and destruct us. So, where, so in the promised land, right? Where in the promised land is the type of heaven or the presence of God? Jerusalem. When God says he is going to return the body of Christ back to Jerusalem, it's referred to in the book of Revelation as the new Jerusalem. All right? So we are approaching the final jubilee. Now, if we go to the book of uh, Daniel, chapter 7, now you're going to have to do a little work for yourself on this one, okay? But what this will help you do is it will establish in your mind exactly when the master came, the year he came, and the prophecies of Daniel as they line up to that because it refers to the Sabbaths and ultimately the day of Jubilee. Every seven, every 49th year, it approached the year of Jubilee. The 50th was the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, all the debts were paid off and everybody went back to their original possession, right? Wherever you left, God wants to bring you back to it and whoever has maintained debt over you, that debt had to be released. They only had 50 years or 49 years to make the most out of you and to work you to death, all right? On the 50th year, it belonged to you. That's why in, in, the, in Egypt, when they came out from Egypt, they had 400 years of back wages, follow me? And all the years they were in forced labor, they did because of their own backslidden condition. But all of those years of forced labor, the Egyptians had to pay for it. And God made them cough it up. He's going to make them cough it up again. Now look, look, at, look at the book of Daniel. And all right, Daniel chapter uh, 9. Do I say 7 or 9? 7. I'm, I'm going to go over to chapter 9, okay? Check this out. This will take you to the Jubilee year. And I'll, I'll take over to the New Testament to back it up for you. So I'll show you. It says in uh, Daniel 9 verse 21, Gabriel, who I had seen in the earlier vision, flew swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice and said, Daniel, I am here to help you understand God's plans. What I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you enough so that you'll know where we are, where God is, what his time plan is. Now, we don't know the day or the hour for this reason, and I'll, I'll show you why. He says, the moment you begin praying, a command was given, and I'm here to tell you. God gave a command to Gabriel, and Gabriel, of course, is the messenger angel. He's the one that brings information concerning the future often in the scriptures. And it says, I'm here to tell you what, it, what was, for God loves you very much. Listen and try to understand the meaning of the vision that you just saw. The Lord has commanded 490 years of further punishment upon Jerusalem. <laughs> 490 years. So he write down 490 years. Out of that 490 years, it says, uh, a further punishment. Uh, and then at last they will learn to stay away from sin. Their guilt will be cleansed and the kingdom of everlasting righteousness will begin and the most holy place in the temple will be rededicated as the prophets have declared. Now listen carefully. It will be 49 years plus the 434 from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was rebuilt in 455 BC. All right? 455 BC. And if we add, or does actually, because you're going backwards, BC toward AD, you subtract it. So the 49 comes to the 406 BC. Then it says, and four, 49 years plus 434 from the time of until the appointed one comes. Jerusalem streets and walls will be rebuilt despite perilous times. After the period of 434 years, the anointed one will be killed or cut off and his kingdom shall be, st and his kingdom still unrealized. And a king will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. Now that's getting into the Antichrist. But if we get back here and we look at the numbers, your numbers come out like this. 70 weeks have been determined. Less, it's at 69, the seven, seven sabbaths, which is seven times, I'm telling you, it'll confuse you if you don't listen, seven times 69. And the 70th week is the seven year period after that. So there's 69 weeks and then there's a gap. That final gap is the final week or the final seven years, which we call the period during which Antichrist rises up. Three and a half years, he cuts his, his alliances and, and forms a war against Israel. So having said that to you, we know that the final jubilee, which is the return of Jesus Christ, we're still waiting to take place now because when Jesus came in Luke, read this one, this will help you. In the book of Luke 4, verse 18 and 19, because I want to establish the last jubilee and why this is important to you. What did I say happened on the year of jubilee? Return and restoration, right? Now, look at this one. Luke 4, verse 18. The spirit of Jesus getting up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the sanctuary, right? And he's reading from the Torah. 
and he finds this particular passage of scripture which is speaking about the year of Jubilee and the coming of the Messiah. So we want to establish that Jesus really is establishing, I am the Messiah. This is, as they knew very well, the year of Jubilee, the 50th year. And I came to do something. What did he come to do? He says, he has anointed me, he identifies himself, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim what? Liberty. Everyone yell liberty. liberty. To proclaim or preach liberty to the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What did he come to do? To redeem and restore. He said, I am he. This is the final jubilee which establishes Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and then the next jubilee will be his coming. Are you following me? Yes. He says this is the acceptable year, the jubilee year, right? Uh, let's have a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. Now we're going to skip to what it's going to be like when the final jubilee comes. Now how do we know the... See, they try to count the days and the years off to establish when Jesus Christ is going to return. And the reason it's never worked up to this point, even some of the ones that are very well known, it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is that the final 77 years, that final seven-year period leading up to the final uh, Jubilee year has not been established. It's, it's fluid. It's flexible. And the reason it's flexible is the work had to be established in the Gentile church before Jesus Christ could come. Now listen to this. Back, back it up one more verse, verse 51. Apostle Paul speaking under the unction here. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep or die, right? But we will all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. The last trump was the shofar that was sounded on the day of Jubilee, on the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, at the last trump, Jesus Christ says he will return. And it says here the same thing. At the last trumpet, for the trump will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. That tells me he's talking here about the, the day of Jubilee and the return of Jesus Christ as to basically when that's going to happen. Why don't we know? Why can't we just count forward 50 years from the final uh, 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 Jubilee? Because if we count forward from when Jesus Christ identifies himself in the temple as the Messiah and as a fulfillment of Jubilee, bringing sight, restoration, healing, deliverance, everything you lost, I've come now to restore it. Hallelujah, that's great. But it was dependent upon them receiving him as Savior and Lord. The whole idea of redeem and restore is going to happen to everybody in the world. Those who have become Christians, everyone, including the Jews, will come to a point where they will understand and receive and accept Jesus Christ as Messiah. It can't happen, according to the Scripture, until the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And, and unless you guys are all Jewish, that's most of us, or all of us. Even if you've got a bit of Jewish blood in you, it doesn't matter. He says, Jesus said, because the Jews, my own people, rejected me, they will have to pay the price for their rejection, which is they're going to have to wait until all the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, then they will have opportunity. But think about the idea of the entire world got its population from Adam and Eve. If you're a Christian, you believe that, right? Therefore, the whole idea of racism is antiquated because God is not calling people home because of the color of their skin. He's calling them home because they have a lineage in God. They are all God's children, but not all God's children will accept God. That's why the apostasy is, is happening now, the great falling away. And Jesus said, even the very elect, which is the body of Christ, will also fall away unless I intervene and come quicker. So having said that to you, how do we know? Here's another scripture for you. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. Always the coming of the Lord comes with a shout and the sound of a shofar, trump. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. And the Lord himself, say praise God. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, the trumpet of God, the shofar will sound. He'll hear, you'll actually hear a sound because it's blown by an angel. If you get into the scriptures, the whole is going... You're going to hear the whole, all the world vibrate with that. And then those of us who are alive, you won't even have a chance to say, what is that? Because you'll be caught up. Now, when is this going to happen? Are you going to have to go through any of this bad stuff? Yes. Yeah. Because the price has to be paid. But more importantly, time has to be given for the world to accept the Messiah. Until that happens, only those who choose him can receive him. The ones who 
refuse him, they'll also live forever too, but they won't live with the angels of God with heaven. Everyone is born with the, with the, with the, with the key ins, inserted into them that has eternal life written on it. You're all created in the image of God. You'll all live spiritually, eternally. But who has the ownership papers on your spirit determines where you live eternally. Because what happens eventually in the last days is, and the falling away takes place, which means many, the lawlessness shall increase, They'll become lovers of self and haters of God. They'll become mockers of the things that are of God. I want to excite you with this because ultimately as a Christian, with the Spirit of God in you, you are not going to lose. You cannot lose. All right? And it has to come down to, if you know the times in which you live, then you can get into the boxing ring knowing that I may get knocked down, but I won't get knocked out. And I, I see that champion's belt over there, you know, in a, in a closet somewhere, and it's got my name on it because I don't, I don't care how bad I get beaten up, I'm still going to get up because the Lord will raise me up. And, and when he does, he has a reward for me. It's, a boxer looks for a belt. I, I, I look for my name to be recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, you see? And, and so also knowing that he'll take care of me as my daddy. The prodigal son talks about that in Luke, doesn't it? And he said, it's not just a story about the Jews and the Gentiles. If you read the story, if we had time, we could tell, it's, an, it's an amazing account of the father waiting for the son to come home, which is the story of Jesus Christ, <laughs> you see? No matter how bad you guys screw up or I screw up, we make mistakes every day of the week. We say and do things that we know are wrong and we repent and ask God to forgive us. And he said, it's just in faith. He erases all that, all right? But, but you've still got to know in the end, we win. Yeah. All right? Because without that knowledge, Satan can pull you down into that mirage of, of, of helplessness and hopelessness and depression that people don't get out of without drugs, alcohol or something else, see? So, so we've got to continue to encourage ourselves in the things of God that the prophets are here to, um, to not just uh, advise you, but to warn you concerning the things that are of the last days. Our job is to help you inherit your inheritance. Follow me? You are to help redeem the, the, redeem the days because the days are evil. And when the prophets were sent, they were always sent just prior to a, a, a land-shaking movement of the Holy Ghost to bring God's people back to a place of restoration and redemption. Glory be to God forever. I'm glad you're so excited about it. So it says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord for that. Let's have a look at the book of Matthew. Let's have a look at the book of Matthew. When I'm finished here, I want to get your full persuasion that not only are we in the days of redemption and restoration, it's happening right now, but we are also in the time when God is preparing his people mentally and spiritually to be able to connect themselves to him in a way that is permanent. He, see, it's all about the marriage supper of the lamb. I mean, we've been dating God for 2,000 years. So what he's saying is when he comes and that redemption takes place, the restoration takes place, when they came out of Egypt, the Egyptians were, were told, give everybody what they want. And when they came out, they came out not just with the provision, but they came out whole and healthy. Not, not one sickly person amongst them. Their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, so that's what I'm talking about. Trump, the Jubilee. Jubilee is, 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 you get the payoff, the devil pays the price, and it can never be taken from you. See, if you have debts, you know, things, mistakes you make, all of those things are erased, and everything that you lost materially, spiritually, emotionally, all of that, it's yours again. See? Now, now, now you can do this again, see, for, for another 49 years, and on the 50th year, it'll happen all over again. But this time, the 50th year will be the last jubilee. When Jesus comes, it'll all be taken care of in a twinkling of an eye. You and I will be changed. All your debts forgiven. All the restoration taking place. All the redemption taking place. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb, where Jesus actually gives his hand to you and you marry him. Then you, see, then the covenant is cut forever. I mean, to me, it's the final payoff. Now listen to this. Matthew 24. Can you tell I've been reading more? Yeah. Matthew chapter 24. Now, Matthew 24 is, is, is you know, everybody knows that's, that's a sort of recap of the entire return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we just want to look at a little bit of it here. Matthew 24. And I want to go down to about, look around verse 4. Don't let, I'm just going to read the first two verses and I'll skip down. Don't let anyone fool you, Jesus says, right? About when is he going to come back and, you know, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And he asked three questions. So Jesus said, don't let anyone fool you. In other words, deception is going to be the biggie thing. For many will come claiming to be Messiah and will lead many astray. Many will come, will come saying that they are the deliverer. They are the redeemer. 
Now, what he's saying there is that the, the, the false prophets, the false messiahs, may not be seen immediately you as, to you as being false, just coming with a messianic message, a teacher with a messianic message. And it says, uh, when you hear of wars beginning, this doesn't signal my return, this must yet come, but the end is not yet. Now, he talks here about wars, rumors of wars, blah, blah, blah. Do you know that one of the four beasts, of course, that's in Daniel, uh, is, is the leopard. And the, the leopard is current day Iran. Did, did you know that? Persia is now Iran. Uh, look at Iran because they're stirring stuff up real good. Uh, it says the wars are over. Daniel said there's going to be one major world war before what you and I know to be tribulation. We're going to talk about the coming of the Messiah and tribulation just now. Iran or Persia is going to be one of those countries raised up in the last days that is going to be a troublemaker to Israel. It's already setting itself up. That's the reason they've been pushing for nuclear weapons, because they'll use them. So look to the news headlines. Two, I want you to look for. One, for the signing or the release of the draft document of a peace document between Israel and Palestine. And it's going to be marketed by this administration. And if Trump gets in again, and I believe he will, unless something dramatic happens, uh, then you'll probably see that signing of that seven-year peace treaty very shortly. It was, it was broadcast on a foreign news station just recently that that uh, announcement will come before the end of September. But we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. But look for that seven-year peace treaty and look for the gathering together of representatives from Europe to come together and sign that seven-year peace treaty. Antichrist will be at that meeting. Do I think he's alive now? Absolutely. You've got to try to get an idea of the big picture. The reason Christians get deceived and backslide, are you listening, is, is because they are deceived into not understanding the truth. This stuff isn't being taught to people. It, it isn't. Because, oh, we don't want to panic you and have you quit the church. Well, listen, they're going to quit the church anyhow. Because those who leave are leaving because they have no walk with God. And they're not being encouraged with that walk with God. What greater encouragement can a father give his children other than to say to them, listen, I've worked hard all my life. I've got a bunch of money and you all are going to inherit it. Oh, that's good news, daddy. Daughters or sons, doesn't matter. You are sons and daughters, therefore you will be part of my inheritance. You are all of my inheritance. The children of God are all of God's inheritance. That's why he's coming back, see, to redeem you to himself. The marriage supper of the Lamb, see? And Jesus said, don't, don't be deceived now. Everybody whose, whose name is recorded is going to be at that marriage supper of the Lamb. Some are going to try to get in at the last minute. Well, you read that story, right? How did you get in here without a wedding garment? Without a wedding garment on. So even those who think they're going to outsmart God won't be able to because he knows everything. Okay, let's skip on down here to uh, verse 29. You can read all this. It's a microcosm of the last days, the three questions that were asked of Jesus. And it includes, of course, his return. Now, verse 29, immediately after the persecution of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her life, the stars will seem to fall from the heavens and powers overshadowing the earth will be convulsed. Now, the tribulation of the saints has already begun at this point. All right, Not the seven-year tribulation, that's, this is not yet. But before that, Christianity is already being persecuted. How many of you know that? Judaism, Christianity, all of it now is being considered al passe. And now we have become gods to ourselves. The commandments of God all taken out of the schools, taken out of the government systems. They're gradually being restored a little bit at a time, but so much damage has been done since Woodrow Wilson that, you know, it would be impossible to bring it all back the way it is. That's why the first thing that God wants to restore is the ability of this world system and in, and in particular the United States to economically carry the needs of the body of Christ. Would you think that God would actually raise up a whole country just to pay you? Oh yes, absolutely. You know, a broke America is not going to be popular in these last days and it's not likely to happen. But those who apportion themselves of the blessings of God have got to be in the right place at the right time with the right attitude. Amen. They've got to be taking the kingdom of God by force. Yeah, yeah. Just like the woman with the issue of blood. Everything she did failed. She lost everything she had. She had nothing left. And then said to herself, if I could just get to God, if I can get to Christ, see, I can be made whole. Amen. This is, the, re this is the, rest them, the redeeming and the restoration. This is the part of the body of Christ that are coming back to Jesus. What is important is a voice crying in the wilderness say, make straight the ways and the paths of God. See, the Messiah is coming again. The same spirit that was on Elijah was on John the Baptist. And Jesus said before he returns, that same spirit, Elijah, is going to come back again yelling the same stuff. Jesus is coming soon. Get your act together. Bring yourselves back to God. Submit yourselves to the altar of God. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. See, all of, this is all a big move. See, and if the people don't recognize it, it's because they're deceived. They are blinded. Jesus said, why are you going to the Pharisees and the scribes? The blind lead the blind and they're both going to fall into the ditch. 
you're following blind, dumb people. The Holy Spirit didn't come that you could stay blind, but he can't override your will. You can choose which church you go to if that church still preaches paganism. People will still choose to go there because it gives them the right to make a decision for themselves as to how big their deception is going to be. And I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you that the Lord is not finished with you. And he is bringing you back from the place of your exile. All of this began when Israel fulfilled the prophecy that before the Messiah returns, he will, God will start bringing all God's people back to the land of Israel, right? Before the day of Jubilee, God's people have to have an open door into their own country, which is a fulfillment of the prophecy that I will redeem and restore that which you've lost, right? Not just Israel has lost their relationship with God. Every, every, every nation in the world is connected one way or another to Israel. All the people of the earth have their root in God. Therefore, as Israel fell away and lost their place, so as most of the Gentile countries lost their place. But the point of all of this is that ultimately they will all be restored and God will bring them all back to the house of God. And when you see the people of God migrating, which has happened actually since 1948 when Israel became a nation, and then it had the right to be able to issue its own, you know, documentation and all the rest of it. Then the Jews started to be removed from all over the world. Now what's happening lately is even more interesting. They're coming in from Iran, which is Persia. They're coming in from Russia. They're coming in from every European nation because God knows that Europe is going to be the bed center of the system of Antichrist. So even now God is opening the doors in Israel for his people to come home. Now when the time comes that he says so, then God will bring that ultimate redemption and in Jesus Christ the Messiah will return and his promises and blessings and redemption with him. Glory be to God. They, they always say, oh, there's more to be fulfilled in the scriptures before he can come. Nothing of dramatic value. Where was I? Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from man, the powers of heaven. This talks about political things as well as natural occurrences. Then the sign of the Son of Man, listen carefully, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now it's talking there about Israel being the tribes. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why? Because now they recognize they made a mistake. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. When? When will they see this? After the, after, the trip, after the signs of that particular age and time come, it says here, the Son of Man will come, well, I'll see the Son of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Next verse. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four corners, uh, 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 four winds, end of heaven to the other. Next verse. Now learn this parable. When you see the branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, know that summer is nigh. So at the same time he's saying here, if you read in, a little bit further back, it talks about the tribulation of the times, the signs of the times and tribulation itself and the powers of the earth shaken and w the, the wars all erupting. After these things have taken, it says, after these things have taken place, you will see the son of, sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. That's when he returns. So we have to understand and prepare ourselves that God is, if we don't know and recognize that God is preparing us for difficult times which prelude the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah for the second time. If we don't recognize the signs of the times, we are caught with our spiritual pants down. And so we're going to be looking for reasons not to accept that end game. And the answer to that is Satan bringing apostasy into the earth. Ecclesiastes 2.26 says that there is a ministry given unto the unrighteous, which is heaping up and storing up for those who are right before God. It's good news, isn't it? This is another part here, which I want you to read for yourself. Exodus 3, 21 and 22, talking there about borrowing of the Egyptians. It's going to happen again. God fulfilling his promises. 